by Percy Bysshe Shelley. The, the Cenci. Cenci. The scene lies principally in Rome, but changes during the fourth act to Petrella, a castle among the Apulian Apennines. Time during the pontificate of Clement the Eighth. Act One, Scene One: An apartment in the Cenci Palace. Enter Count Cenci and Cardinal Camillo. That matter of the murder is hushed up. If you consent to yield His Holiness your fief that lies beyond the Pincian Gate, it needed all my interest in the conclave to bend him to this point. He said that you bought perilous impunity with your gold, that crimes like yours, if once or twice compounded, enrich the church and respited from hell an erring soul which might repent and live, but that the glory and the interest of the high throne he fills little consist with making it a daily mark of guilt as manifold and hideous as the deeds which you scarce hide from men's revolted eyes. The third of my possessions, let it go. I, I once heard the nephew of the Pope, had sent his architect to view the ground meaning to build a villa on my vines. The next time I compounded with his uncle, I little thought he should outwit me so. Henceforth, no witness, not the lamp, shall see that which the vassal threatened to divulge, whose throat is choked with dust for his reward. The deed he saw could not have rated higher than his most worthless life. It angers me. Respited me from hell? So may the devil respite their souls from heaven. No doubt Pope Clement and his most charitable nephews pray that the Apostle Peter and the saints will grant for their sake that I long enjoy strength, wealth, and pride, and lust and length of days wherein to act the deeds which are the stewards of their revenue. But much yet remains to which they show no title. O oh, Count Shenchi, so much that thou mightst honourably live and reconcile thyself with thine own heart and with thy God and with the offended world. How hideously look deeds of lust and blood through those snow-white and venerable hairs! Your children should be sitting round you now, but that you fear to read upon their looks the shame and misery you have written there. Where is your wife? Where is your gentle daughter? Methinks her sweet looks, which make all things else beauteous and glad, might kill the fiend within you. Why is she barred from all society but her own strange and uncomplaining wrongs? Talk with me, Count. You know I mean you well. I stood beside your dark and fiery youth, watching its bold and bad career as men watch meteors, but it vanished not. I marked your desperate and remorseless manhood. Now do I behold you in dishonourable age, charged with a thousand unrepented crimes. Yet I have ever hoped that you would amend and in that hope have saved your life three times. For which Aldo Brandino owes you now, my fief beyond the Pincian Cardinal. One thing I pray you, recollect henceforth, and so we shall converse with less restraint. A man you knew spoke of my wife and daughter. He was accustomed to frequent my house, so the next day his wife and daughter came, and asked if I had seen him, and I smiled. I think they never saw him any more. Thou execrable man, beware! 
of thee? Nay, this is idle. We should know each other. As to my character, for what men call crime, seeing I please my senses as I list, and vindicate that right with force or guile. It is a public matter, and I care not if I discuss it with you. I may speak alike to you in my own conscious heart, for you give out that you have half reformed me. Therefore strong vanity will keep you silent, if fear should not. Both will, I do not doubt. All men delight in sensual luxury. All men enjoy revenge, and most exalt over the tortures they can never feel, flattering their secret peace with others' pain. But I delight in nothing else. I love the sight of agony and the sense of joy, when this shall be another's and that mine. And I have no remorse and little fear, which are, I think, the checks of other men. This mood has grown upon me until now. Any design my captious fancy makes, the picture of its wish, and it forms none but such as men like you would start to know, is as my natural food and rest debarred, until it be accomplished. Art thou not most miserable? Why miserable? No, I am what your theologians call hardened, which they must be in impudence. So to revile a man's peculiar taste, true, I was happier than I am, while well, yet manhood remained to act the thing I thought, while lust was sweeter than revenge. And now invention palls. Ay, we must all grow old, and by that there yet remains a deed to act, whose horror might make sharp an appetite duller than mine. I do, I know not what, when I was young, I thought of nothing else but pleasure, and fed on honey sweets. Men, by St. Thomas, I cannot live like bees, and I grew tired. Yet, till I killed a foe, and heard his groans, and heard his children's groans, I knew not what delight was else on earth, which now delights me little. I the rather look on such pangs as terror ill conceals, the dry fixed eyeball, the pale quivering lip, which tell me that the spirit weeps within, tears bitterer than the bloody sweat of Christ. I rarely kill the body, which preserves, like a strong prison, the soul within my power, wherein I feed it with the breath of fear for hourly pain. Hell's most abandoned fiend did never in the drunkenness of guilt speak to his heart as now you speak to me. I thank my God that I believe you not. Enter Andrea. My lord, a gentleman from Salamanca would speak with you. Bid him attend me in the grand saloon. Exit Andrea. Farewell, and I will pray, almighty God, that thy false impious words tempt not his spirit to abandon thee. Exit Camillo. The third of my possessions. I must use close husbandry or gold, the old man's sword, falls from my withered hand. But yesterday there came an order from the Pope to make fourfold provision for my cursed sons, whom I had sent from Rome to Salamanca, hoping some accident might cut them off, and meaning, if I could, to starve them there. I pray thee, God, send some quick death upon them. Bernardo 
and my wife could not be worse, if dead and damned, then as to be a treachy. Looking around him suspiciously, I think they cannot hear me at that door. What if they should? And yet I need not speak, though the heart triumphs with itself in words. Oh, thou most silent air, that shalt not hear what now I think, thou pavement which I tread towards her chamber. Let your echoes talk of my imperious step scorning surprise, but not of my intent. Andrea! Enter Andrea. My lord? Bid Beatrice attend me in her chamber. This evening, no, at midnight, and alone. Exeunt. Scene two. A garden of the Cenci Palace. Enter Beatrice and Orsino, as in conversation. Pervert not truth, Orsino. You remember where we held that conversation. Nay, we see the spot even from this cypress. Two long years are passed since, on an April midnight, underneath the moonlit ruins of Mount Palatine, I did confess to you my secret mind. You said you loved me then. You are a priest. Speak to me not of love. I may obtain the dispensation of the Pope to marry. Because I am a priest, do you believe your image, as the hunter some struck deer, follows me not whether I wake or sleep? As I have said, speak to me not of love. Had you a dispensation I have not, nor will I leave this home of misery whilst my poor Bernard, and that gentle lady to whom I owe life, and these virtuous thoughts must suffer what I still have strength to share. Alas, Orsino, all the love that once I felt for you is turned to bitter pain. Ours was a youth contract, which you first broke by assuming vows no pope will loose. And thus I love you still, but holily, even as a sister or a spirit might, and so I swear a cold fidelity. And it is well perhaps we shall not marry. You have a sly, equivocating vein that suits me not. Ah, oh, wretched that I am. Where shall I turn? Even now you look on me as you were not my friend, as if you discovered that I thought so, with false smiles making my true suspicion seem your wrong. Ah, uh, no, forgive me. Sorrow makes me seem sterner than else my nature might have been. I have a weight of melancholy thoughts, and they forebode. But what can they forebode worse than I now endure? All will be well. Is the petition yet prepared? You know my zeal for all you wish, sweet Beatrice, and doubt not but I will use my utmost skill so that the Pope attend to your complaint. Your zeal for all I wish. Ah, me, you are cold. Your utmost skill. Speak but one word. Aside. Alas. Weak and deserted creature that I am, here I stand bickering with my only friend. To Orsino. This night my father gives a sumptuous feast, Orsino. He has heard some happy news from Salamanca, from my brothers there. And with this outward show of love he mocks his inward hate. Tis bold hypocrisy, for he would gladly or celebrate their deaths, which I have heard him pray for on his knees. Great God, that such a father should be mine. But there is a mighty preparation made, and all our kin, the Chenchi, will be there, and all the chief nobility of Rome, and he has bidden me and my pale mother attire ourselves in festival array. Poor lady, she expects some happy change in his dark spirit from this act. I? None. At supper I will give you the petition. Till when? Farewell. Farewell. Exit Beatrice. I know the Pope will ne'er absolve me from my priestly vow, but by absolving me from the revenue of many a wealthy see, 
and Beatrice, I think, to win thee at an easier rate. Nor shall he read her eloquent petition. He might bestow her on some poor relation of his sixth cousin, as he did her sister, and I should be debarred from all access. Then, as to what she suffers from her father, in all this there is much exaggeration. Old men are testy and will have their way. A man may stab his enemy or his vassal and live a free life as to wine or women, and with a peevish temper may return to a dull home and rate his wife and children. Daughters and wives call this foul tyranny. I shall be well content if on my conscience there rests no heavier sin than what they suffer from the devices of my love, a net from which he shall escape not. Yet I fear her subtle mind, her awe-inspiring gaze, whose beams anatomize me, nerve by nerve, and lay me bare, and make me blush to see my hidden thoughts. Ah, no! A friendless girl who clings to me as to her only hope? I were a fool, no less than if a panther were panic-stricken by the antelope's eye, if she escaped me. Exit Scene three. A magnificent hall in the Chenchi Palace. A banquet. Enter Chenchi, Lucretia, Beatrice, Orsino, Camillo, nobles. Welcome, my friends and kinsmen. Welcome, ye princes and cardinals, pillars of the church, whose presence honors our festivity. I have too long lived like an anchorite, and in my absence from your merry meetings, an evil word is gone abroad of me. But I do hope that you, my noble friends, when you have shared the entertainment here, and heard the pious cause for which tis given, and we have pledged a health or two together, will think me flesh and blood as well as you. Sinful indeed, for Adam made all so, but tender-hearted, meek, and pitiful. In truth, my lord, you seem too light of heart, too sprightly and companionable a man, to act the deeds that rumor pins on you. To his companion. I never saw such blithe and open cheer in any eye. Some most desired event, in which we all demand a common joy, has brought us hither. Let us hear it, Count. It is indeed a most desired event, if when a parent from a parent's heart lifts from this earth to the great Father of all a prayer, both when he lays him down to sleep, and when he rises up from dreaming it, one supplication. One desire, one hope, that he would grant a wish for his two sons, even all that he demands in their regard, and suddenly beyond his dearest hope it is accomplished. He should then rejoice, and call his friends and kinsmen to a feast, and task their love to grace his merriment. Then honor me thus far, for I am he. Beatrice, to Lucretia. Great God, how horrible! Some dreadful ill must have befallen my brothers. Fear not, child, he speaks too frankly. Ah, oh, my blood runs cold. I fear that wicked laughter round his eye, which wrinkles up the skin even to the hair. Here are the letters brought from Salamanca. Beatrice. Read them to your mother. God, I thank thee. In one night didst thou perform, by ways inscrutable, the thing I sought. My disobedient and rebellious sons are dead. Why dead? What means this change of cheer? You hear me not? I tell you, they are dead, and they will need no food or raiment more. 
The tapers that did light them the dark way are their last cost. The Pope, I think, will not expect I should maintain them in their coffins. Rejoice with me, my heart is wondrous glad. Lucretia sinks, half fainting. Beatrice supports her. It is not true. Dear lady, pray look up. Had it been true, there is a God in heaven. He would not live to boast of such a boon. Unnatural man, thou knowest that it is false. I, as the word of God, whom here I call, to witness that I speak the sober truth, and whose most favoring providence was shown, even in the manner of their deaths. For Rocco was kneeling at the mass with sixteen others when the church fell and crushed him to a mummy. The rest escaped unhurt. Cristofano was stabbed in error by a jealous man, whilst she he loved was sleeping with his rival, all in the selfsame hour of the same night. Which shews that heaven has special care of me. I beg those friends who love me that they mark the day of feast upon their calendars. It was the twenty seventh of December. I read the letters if you doubt my oath. The assembly appears confused. Several of the guests rise. Oh, horrible! I will depart. And die. No, stay. I do believe it is some jest, though, faith, tis mocking us somewhat too solemnly. I think his son has married the Infanta, or found a mine of gold in El Dorado. Tis but to season some such news. Stay, stay. I see tis only raillery by his smile. Chenchi, filling a bowl of wine and lifting it up. O oh, thou bright wine whose purple splendor leaps and bubbles gaily in this golden bowl, under the lamplight as my spirits do, to hear the death of my accursed sons, could I believe thou wert their mingled blood, then would I taste thee like a sacrament, and pledge with thee the mighty devil in hell? Who, if a father's curses, as men say, Climb with swift wings after their children's souls, and drag them from the very throne of heaven. Now triumphs in my triumph, but thou art superfluous. I have drunken deep of joy, and I will taste no other wine tonight. Here, Andrea, bear the bowl around. A guest rising. Thou wretch, will none among this noble company check the abandoned villain? For God's sake, let me dismiss the guests. You are insane. Some ill will come of this. Seize, silence him. I will. And I. Chenchi, addressing those who rise with a threatening gesture. Who moves? Who speaks? Turning to the company. Tis nothing. Enjoy yourselves. Beware, for my revenge is as the sealed commission of a king that kills in none dare name the murderer. The banquet is broken up. Several of the guests are departing. I do entreat you. Go not, noble guests. What, although tyranny and impious hate stand sheltered by a father's hoary hair? What, if tis he who clothed us in these limbs, who tortures them and triumphs? What, if we, the desolate and the dead, were his own flesh, his children and his wife, whom he is bound to love and shelter? Shall we therefore find no refuge in this merciless wide world? Oh, think what deep wrongs must have blotted out. First love, then reverence in a child's prone mind, till it thus vanquish shame and fear. Oh, think 
I have borne much and kissed the sacred hand which crushed us to the earth and thought its stroke was perhaps some paternal chastisement. Have excused much, doubted, and when no doubt remained, have sought by patience, love, and tears to soften him. And when this could not be, I have knelt down through the long sleepless nights and lifted up to God, the Father of all, passionate prayers. And when these were not heard, I have still borne, until I meet you here, princes and kinsmen, at this hideous feast given at my brother's deaths. Two yet remain, his wife remains, and I, whom if ye save not, ye may soon share such merriment again as fathers make over their children's graves. O Prince Colonna, thou art our near kinsman. Cardinal, thou art the Pope's chamberlain. Camilo, thou art chief judiciary. Take us away. Chenchi, he has been conversing with Camillo during the first part of Beatrice's speech. He hears the conclusion and now advances. I hope my good friends here will think of their own daughters, or perhaps of their own throats, before they lend an ear to this wild girl. Beatrice, not noticing the words of Chenchi. Dare no one look on me? None answer? Can one tyrant overbear the sense of many best and wisest men? Or is it that I sue not in some form of scrupulous law that ye deny my suit? O oh God, that I were buried with my brothers, and that the flowers of this departed spring were fading on my grave, and that my father were celebrating now one feast for all. A bitter wish for one so young and gentle. Can we do nothing? Nothing that I see. Count Chenchi were a dangerous enemy, yet I would second any one. And I. Retire to your chamber, insolent girl. Retire thou, impious man. I hide thyself where never I can look upon thee more. Wouldst thou have honor and obedience who art a torturer? Father, never dream, though thou mayest overbear this company, but ill must come of ill. Frown not on me. Haste, hide thyself, lest with avenging looks my brother's ghost should hunt thee from thy seat. Cover thy face from every living eye, and start if thou but hear a human step. Seek out some dark and silent corner. There, bow thy white head before offended God, and we will kneel around and fervently pray that he pity both ourselves and thee. My friends, I do lament this insane girl has spoilt the mirth of our festivity. Good night. Farewell. I will not make you longer spectators of our dull domestic quarrels. Another time. Exeunt all but Chenchi and Beatrice. My brain is swimming round. Give me a bowl of wine. To Beatrice. Thou painted viper, beast that thou art, fair and yet terrible. I know a charm shall make thee meek and tame. Now get thee from my sight. Exit Beatrice. Here, Andrea, fill up this goblet with Greek wine. I said I would not drink this evening, but I must. For strange to say, I feel my spirits fail with thinking what I have decreed to do. Drinking the wine. Be thou the resolution of quick youth within my veins and manhood's purpose stern. In age's firm, cold, subtle villainy, As if thou wert indeed my children's blood, Which I did thirst to drink. The charm works well. It must be done. It shall be done, I swear. Exit. Act Two, Scene One. An apartment in the Chenchi Palace. Enter Lucretia and Bernardo. Weep not, my gentle boy. He struck but me who have borne deeper wrongs. 
In truth, if he had killed me, he had done a kinder deed. O oh God Almighty, do thou look upon us. We have no other friend but only thee. Yet weep not. Though I love you as my own, I am not your true mother. Oh, more, more than ever mother was to any child, that you have been to me. Had he not been my father, do you think that I should weep? Alas, poor boy, what else couldst thou have done? Enter Beatrice. Beatrice, in a hurried voice. Did he pass this way? Have you seen him, brother? Ah, uh, no, that is his step upon the stairs. Tis nearer now. His hand is on the door. Mother, if I to thee have ever been a duteous child, now save me. Thou great God, whose image upon earth a father is, dost thou indeed abandon me? He comes. The door is opening now. I see his face. He frowns on others, but he smiles on me, even as he did after the feast last night. Enter a servant. Almighty God, how merciful thou art. Tis but Orsino's servant. Well, what news? My master bids me say, the Holy Father has sent back your petition thus unopened. Giving a paper. And he demands at what hour t'were secure to visit you again. At the Ave Maria. Exit servant. So, daughter, our last hope has failed. How oh, me, how pale you look. You tremble and you stand wrapped in some fixed and fearful meditation, as if one thought were overstrong for you. Your eyes have a chill glare. Oh, dearest child, are you gone mad? If not, pray speak to me. You see, I am not mad. I speak to you. You talked of something that your father did after that dreadful feast. Could it be worse than when he smiled and cried, My sons are dead, and everyone looked in his neighbor's face to see if others were as white as he? At the first word he spoke, I felt the blood rush to my heart and fell into a trance. And when it passed, I sat all weak and wild, whilst you alone stood up and with strong words checked his unnatural pride, and I could see the devil was rebuked that lives in him. Until this hour thus have you ever stood between us and your father's moody wrath, like a protecting presence. Your firm mind has been our only refuge and defense. What can have thus subdued it? What can now have given you that cold, melancholy look, succeeding to your unaccustomed fear? What is it that you say? I was just thinking twere better not to struggle any more. Men like my father have been dark and bloody, yet never... Oh, before worse comes of it, twere wise to die. It ends in that at last. Oh, talk not so, dear child. Tell me at once, what did your father do or say to you? He stayed not after that accursed feast one moment in your chamber. Speak to me. Oh, sister, sister, prithee, speak to us. Beatrice, speaking very slowly with a forced calmness. It was one word, mother. One little word. One look. One smile. Oh, he has trampled me under his feet and made the blood stream down my pallid cheeks. And he has given us all ditch water and the fever-stricken flesh of buffaloes and bade us eat or starve, and we have eaten. He has made me look on my beloved Bernardo when the rust of heavy chains has gangrened his sweet limbs, and I have never yet despaired. But now, what could I say? Recovering herself. Ah. Oh. No, tis nothing new. The sufferings we all share have made me wild. He only struck and cursed me as he passed. He said, he looked, he did, nothing at all beyond his want. Yet it disordered me. Alas, I am forgetful of my duty. I should preserve my senses for your sake. Nay, Beatrice, have courage, my sweet girl. If any one despairs, it should be I who loved him once and now must live with him till God in pity call for him 
or me. For you may, like your sister, find some husband, and smile years hence with children round your knees, whilst I, then dead, and all this hideous coil shall be remembered only as a dream. Talk not to me, dear lady of a husband. Did you not nurse me when my mother died? Did you not shield me and that dearest boy? And had we any other friend but you in infancy, with gentle words and looks, to win our father not to murder us? And shall I now desert you? May the ghost of my dead mother plead against my soul if I abandon her who filled the place she left, with more even than a mother's love. And I am of my sister's mind. Indeed, I would not leave you in this wretchedness, even though the Pope should make me free to live in some blithe place, like others of my age, with sports and delicate food and the fresh air. Oh, never think that I will leave you, mother. My dear, dear children. Enter Chenchi suddenly. What? Beatrice here? Come hither. She shrinks back and covers her face. Nay, hide not your face, tis fair. Look up, why yester night you dared to look with disobedient insolence upon me, bending a stern and an inquiring brow on what I meant, whilst I then sought to hide that which I came to tell you, but in vain. Beatrice, wildly staggering towards the door. Oh, that the earth would gape! Hide me, O oh God! Then it was I whose inarticulate words fell from my lips, and who with tottering steps fled from your presence, as you now from mine. Stay, I command you, from this day and hour. Never again, I think, with fearless eye, and brow superior, and unaltered cheek and that lip made for tenderness or scorn, shalt thou strike dumb the meanest of mankind, me least of all. Now get thee to thy chamber, thou too loathed image of thy cursed mother. To Bernardo. Thy milky, meek face makes me sick with hate. Exeunt Beatrice and Bernardo. Chenchi aside. So much has passed between us, as must make me bold, her fearful. Tis an awful thing to touch such mischief as I now conceive. So men sit shivering on the dewy bank, and try the chill stream with their feet. Once in, how the delighted spirit pants for joy. Lucretia, advancing timidly towards him. Oh, husband, pray forgive poor Beatrice. She meant not any ill. Nor you, perhaps? Nor that young imp whom you have taught by rote, parasite with his alphabet? Nor Giacomo? Nor those two most unnatural sons who stirred enmity up against me with the Pope, whom in one night merciful God cut off. Innocent lambs, they thought not any ill. You were not here conspiring. You said nothing of how I might be dungeoned as a madman, or be condemned to death for some offense. And you would be the witnesses, this failing how just it were to hire assassins, or put sudden poison in my evening drink, or smother me when overcome by wine, seeing we had no other judge but God, and he had sentenced me, and there were none but you to be the executioners, of his decree and registered in heaven. Oh, no, you said not this. So help me, God, I never thought the things you charge me with. If you dare speak that wicked lie again, I'll kill you. What? It was not by your counsel that Beatrice disturbed the feast last night? 
You do not hope to stir some enemies against me, and escape, and laugh to scorn, what every nerve of you now trembles at? You judge that men more bolder than they are. Few dare to stand between their grave and me. Look not so dreadfully. By my salvation, I knew not aught that Beatrice designed. Nor do I think she designed anything until she heard you talk of her dead brothers. Blaspheming liar, you are damned for this. But I will take you where you may persuade the stones you tread on to deliver you. For men there shall be none but those who dare all things, not question that which I command. On Wednesday next I shall set out. You know that savage rock, the castle of Petrila. Tis safely walled and moated round about, its dungeons underground, and its thick towers never told tales, though they have heard and seen what might make dumb things speak. Why do you linger? Make speediest preparation for the journey. Exit Lucretia The all-beholding sun yet shines. I hear a busy stir of men about the streets. I see the bright sky through the window panes. It is a garish, broad, and peering day. Loud, light, suspicious full of eyes and ears, and every little corner, nook and hole, is penetrated with the insolent light. Come darkness, yet what is the day to me? And wherefore should I wish for night, who do a deed which shall confound both night and day? Tis she shall grope through a bewildering mist of horror. If there be a sun in heaven, she shall not dare to look upon its beams nor feel its warmth. Let her then wish for night. The act, I think, shall soon extinguish all for me. I bear a darker, deadlier gloom than the earth's shade, or interlunar air, or constellations quenched in murkiest cloud, in which I walk secure and unbeheld towards my purpose. Would that it were done. Exit. Scene two. A chamber in the Vatican. Enter Camillo and Giacomo in conversation. There is an obsolete and doubtful law by which you might obtain a bare provision of food and clothing. Nothing more? Alas! There must be the provision which strict law awards and aged sullen avarice pays. Why did my father not apprentice me to some mechanic trade? I should have then been trained in no high-born necessities which I could meet not by my daily toil. The eldest son of a rich nobleman is heir to all his incapacities. He has wide wants and narrow powers. If you, Cardinal Camillo, were reduced at once from thrice-driven beds of down and delicate food and hundred servants and six palaces to that which nature doth indeed require? Nay, there is reason in your plea. T'were hard. Tis hard for a firm man to bear. But I have a dear wife a lady of high birth, whose dowry in ill hour I lent my father without a bond or witness to the deed, and children who inherit her fine senses, the fairest creatures in this breathing world, and she and they reproach me not. Cardinal, do you not think the Pope would interpose and stretch authority beyond the law? Though your peculiar case is hard, I know the Pope will not divert the course of law. After that impious feast the other night, I spoke to him, and urged him then to check your father's cruel hand. He frowned and said, 
Children are disobedient and they sting their father's hearts to madness and despair, requiting years of care with contumely. I pity the Count Chenchi from my heart. His outraged love perhaps awakened hate, and thus he is exasperated to ill. In the great war between the old and young, I, who have white hairs and a tottering body, will keep at least blameless neutrality. Enter Orsino. You, my good lord Orsino, heard these words? What words? Alas, repeat them not again. There then is no redress for me, at least, none but that which I may achieve myself, since I am driven to the brink. But say my innocent sister and my only brother are dying underneath my father's eye, the memorable torturers of this land, Gallias, Visconti, Borgia, Etzelin, never inflicted on the meanest slave what these endure. Shall they have no protection? Why, if they would petition to the Pope, I see not how he could refuse it. Yet he holds it of most dangerous example in all to weaken the paternal power, being, as twere, the shadow of his own. I pray you now excuse me. I have business that will not bear delay. Exit Camillo. But you, Orsino, have the petition, wherefore not present it? I have presented it, and backed it with my earnest prayers and urgent interest. It was returned unanswered. I doubt not but that the strange and execrable deeds alleged in it, in truth they might well baffle any belief, have turned the Pope's displeasure upon the accusers from the criminal. So I should guess from what Camillo said. My friend, that palace walking devil, gold, has whispered silence to his holiness, and we are left as scorpions ringed with fire. What should we do but strike ourselves to death? For he who is our murderous persecutor is shielded by a father's holy name. Oh, I would... Stops abruptly. What? Fear not to speak your thought. Words are but holy as the deeds they cover. A priest who has forsworn the God he serves. A judge who makes the truth weep at his decree. A friend who should weave counsel as I now, but as the mantle of some selfish guile. A father who is all a tyrant seems, with a profaner for his sacred name. Ask me not what I think. The unwilling brain feigns often that it would not, and we trust imagination with such fantasies as the tongue dares not fashion into words which have no words. Their horror makes them dim to the mind's eye. My heart denies itself to think what you demand. But a friend's bosom is as the inmost cave of our own mind, where you sit shut from the wide gaze of day, and from the all-communicating air. You look what I suspected. Spare me now. I am as one lost in a midnight wood, who dares not ask some harmless passenger the path across the wilderness, lest he, as my thoughts are, should be a murderer. I know you are my friend, and all I dare speak to my soul, that will I trust with thee. But now my heart is heavy, and would take lone counsel from a night of sleepless care. Pardon me, that I say farewell. Farewell. I would that to my own suspected self I could address a word so full of peace. Farewell. Be your thoughts better or more bold. 
Exit Giacomo. I had disposed the Cardinal Camillo to feed his hope with cold encouragement. It fortunately serves my close designs that tis a trick of this same family to analyze their own and others' minds. Such self-anatomy will teach the will dangerous secrets, for it tempts our powers, knowing what must be thought and may be done, into the depth of darkest purposes. So Chenchi fell into the pit. Even I, since Beatrice unveiled me to myself, and made me shrink from what I cannot shun, show a poor figure to my own esteem, to which I grow half reconciled. I'll do as little mischief as I can. That thought shall feed the accuser conscience. After a pause. Now, what harm if Chenchi should be murdered? Yet, if murdered, wherefore by me? And what if I could take the profit, yet omit the sin and peril of such an action? Of all the earthly things, I fear a man whose blows outspeed his words, and such is Chenchi. And while Chenchi lives, his daughter's dowry were a secret grave if a priest wins her. Ah, oh, fair Beatrice, would that I love thee not, or, loving thee, could but despise danger and gold and all that frowns between my wish and its effect, or smiles beyond it. There is no escape. Her bright form kneels beside me at the altar, and follows me to the resort of men, and fills my slumber with tumultuous dreams. So when I wake my blood seems liquid fire. And if I strike my damp and dizzy head, my hot palm scorches it. Her very name, but spoken by a stranger, makes my heart sicken and pant. And thus unprofitably I clasp the phantom of unfelt delights, till weak imagination half possesses the self-created shadow. Yet much longer will I not nurse this life of feverous hours. From the unraveled hopes of Giacomo I must work out my own dear purposes. I see, as from a tower, the end of all. Her father dead, her brother bound to me by a dark secret, surer than the grave. Her mother scared and unexpostulating from the dread manner of her wish achieved. And she, once more, take courage, my faint heart. What dare is a friendless maiden matched with thee? I have such foresight as a sure success. Some unbeheld divinity doth ever, when dread events are near, stir up men's minds to black suggestions. And he prospers best, not who becomes the instrument of ill, but who can flatter the dark spirit that makes its empire and its prey of other hearts till it become his slave as I will do. Exit Act 3, Scene 1 An apartment in the Chenchi Palace Lucretia, to her, enter Beatrice Beatrice, she enters staggering and speaks wildly Reach me that handkerchief My brain is hurt My eyes are full of blood Just wipe them for me I see but indistinctly My sweet child, you have no wound Tis only a cold dew that starts from your dear brow. Alas, alas, what has befallen? How comes this hair undone? Its wandering strings must be what blind me so, and yet I tied it fast. Oh, horrible! The pavement sinks under my feet, the walls spin round. I see a woman weeping there, and standing calm and motionless, whilst I slide giddily as the world reels. My God! The beautiful blue heaven is flecked with blood. The sunshine on the floor is black. The air is changed to vapor, such as the dead breathe in the charnel pits. Ah, I am choked. There creeps a clinging, black, contaminating mist about me. Tis substantial, heavy, thick. I cannot pluck it from me, for it glues my fingers and my limbs to one another and eats into my sinews and dissolves my flesh to a pollution poisoning the subtle, pure, and inmost spirit of life. 
My God, I never knew what the mad felt before, for I am mad beyond all doubt. No, I am dead. These putrefying limbs shut round and sepulchre the painting's soul, which would burst forth into the wandering air. What hideous thought was that I had even now? Tis gone, and yet its burthen remains here. O'er these dull eyes, upon this weary heart. O world, O life, O day, O misery. What ails thee, my poor child? She answers not. Her spirit apprehends the sense of pain, but not its cause. Suffering has dried away the source from which it sprung. Beatrice, frantically. Like parricide, misery has killed its father, yet its father never like mine. Oh God, what thing am I? My dearest child, what has your father done? Beatrice, doubtfully. Who art thou, questioner? I have no father. Aside. And she is the madhouse nurse who tends on me. It is a piteous office. To Lucretia in a slow, subdued voice. Do you know, I thought I was that wretched Beatrice men speak of, whom her father sometimes hails from hall to hall by the entangled hair, at others, pens up naked in the damp cells where scaly reptiles crawl and starves her there, till she will eat strange flesh. This woeful story so did I overact in my sick dreams, that I imagined, no, it cannot be. Horrible things have been in this wild world, prodigious mixtures and confusion strange of good and ill, and worse have been conceived than ever there was found a heart to do. But never fancy image such a deed as... Pauses, suddenly recollecting herself. Who art thou? Swear to me, ere I die with fearful expectation, that indeed thou art not what thou seemest. Mother. Oh, my sweet child, know you. Yet speak it not. For then if this be truth, that other too must be a truth. A firm, enduring truth, linked with each lasting circumstance of life, never to change, never to pass away. Why, so it is. This is the Chenchi Palace. Thou art Lucretia. I am Beatrice. I have talked some wild words, but will no more. Mother, come near me. From this point of time I am... Her voice dies away faintly. Alas, what has befallen thee, child? What has thy father done? What have I done? Am I not innocent? Is it my crime that one with white hair and imperious brow, who tortured me from my forgotten years, as parents only dare, should call himself my father, yet should be? Oh, what am I? What name, what place, what memory shall be mine? What retrospects, outliving even despair? He is a violent tyrant, surely, child. We know that death alone can make us free, his death or ours. But what can he have done of deadlier outrage or worse injury? Thou art unlike thyself. Thine eyes shoot forth a wandering and strange spirit. Speak to me. Unlock those pallid hands whose fingers twine with one another. Tis the restless life tortured within them. If I try to speak... I shall go mad. I, something must be done. What yet, I know not. Something which shall make the thing that I have suffered but a shadow in the dread lightning which avenges it. Brief, rapid, irreversible, destroying the consequence of what it cannot cure. Some such thing is to be endured or done. When I know what, I shall be still and calm, and never anything will move me more. But now, O oh blood, which art my father's blood, circling through these contaminated veins, if thou, poured forth on the polluted earth, could wash away the crime and punishment by which I suffer, no, 
That cannot be. Many might doubt there were a God above who sees and permits evil, and so die. That faith no agony shall obscure in me. It must indeed have been some bitter wrong, yet what I dare not guess. O oh, my lost child, hide not in proud, impenetrable grief thy sufferings from my fear. I hide them not. What are the words which you would have me speak? I, who can feign no image in my mind of that which has transformed me, I, whose thought is like a ghost shrouded and folded up in its own formless horror, of all words that minister to mortal intercourse, which wouldst thou hear? For there is none to tell my misery. If another ever knew aught like to it, she died as I will die, and left it as I must, without a name. Death! Death, our law and our religion call thee a punishment and a reward. Oh, which have I deserved? The peace of innocence, till in your season you be called to heaven. Whatever you may have suffered, you have done no evil. Death must be the punishment of crime, or the reward of trampling down the thorns which God has strewed upon the path which leads to immortality. I, death, the punishment of crime. I pray thee, God, let me not be bewildered while I judge. If I must live day after day and keep these limbs, the unworthy temple of thy spirit, as a foul den from which what thou abhorrest may mock thee unavenged, it shall not be. Self-murder? No, that might be no escape for thy decree yawns like a hell between our will and it. Oh, in this mortal world there is no vindication, and no law which can adjudge and execute the doom of that through which I suffer. Enter Orsino. She approaches him solemnly. Welcome, friend. I have to tell you that since last we met, I have endured a wrong so great and strange that neither life nor death can give me rest. Ask me not what it is, for there are deeds which have no form, sufferings which have no tongue. And what is he who has thus injured you? The man they call my father, a dread name. It cannot be. What it can be or not, forbear to think. It is, and it has been. Advise me how it shall not be again. I thought to die, but a religious awe restrains me, and the dread, lest death itself might be no refuge from the consciousness of what it is yet unexpiated. Oh, speak! Accuse him of the deed, and let the law avenge thee. Oh, ice-hearted counselor, if I could find a word that might make known the crime of my destroyer, and that done, my tongue should like a knife tear out the secret which cankers my heart's core. I lay all bare so that my unpolluted fame should be with vilest gossips a stale-mouthed story, a mock, a byword, an astonishment. If this were done, which never shall be done, think of the offender's gold, his dreaded hate, and the strange horrors of the accuser's tale, baffling belief and overpowering speech, scarce whispered, unimaginable, wrapped in hideous hints, oh, most assured redress. You will endure it, then? Endure? Orsino, it seems your counsel is small profit. Turns from him and speaks half to herself. Aye, all must be suddenly resolved and done. What is this undistinguishable mists of thoughts, which rise, like shadow after shadow, darkening each other? Should the offender live, triumph in his misdeed, and make by use his crime, whatever it is, dreadful, no doubt, thine element, until thou mayest become utterly lost, subdued even to the hue of that which thou permittest? Beatrice to herself. Mighty death, thou double-visioned shadow. Only judge, 
rightfulest arbiter. She retires absorbed in thought. If the lightning of God has ever descended to avenge. Blaspheme not. His high providence commits its glory on this earth and their own wrongs into the hands of men, if they neglect to punish crime. But if one, like this wretch, should mock with gold, opinion, law, and power, if there be no appeal to that which makes the guiltiest tremble, if because our wrongs, for that they are unnatural, strange, and monstrous, exceed all measure of belief, O oh God! If for the very reasons which should make redress most swift and sure our injurer triumphs, and we, the victims, bear worse punishment than that appointed for their torturer. Think not but that there is redress where there is wrong, so we be bold enough to seize it. How? If there were any way to make all sure, I know not, but I think it might be good to... Why? His late outrage to Beatrice, for it is such, as I but faintly guess, as makes remorse dishonor, and leaves her only one duty, how she may avenge. You, but one refuge from ills ill endured. Me, but one counsel. For we cannot hope that aid or retribution or resource will arise thence, where every other one might find them with less need. Beatrice advances. Then? Peace, Orsino. An honored lady, while I speak, I pray that you put off, as garments overworn, forbearance and respect, remorse and fear, and all the fit restraints of daily life, which have been born from childhood, but which now would be a mockery to my holier plea. As I have said, I have endured a wrong, which, though it be expressionless, is such as asks atonement, both for what is past, and lest I be reserved day after day to load with crimes an overburthened soul, and be what ye can dream not. I have prayed to God, and I have talked with my own heart, and have unraveled my entangled will, and have at length determined what is right. Art thou my friend, Orsino? false or true, pledge thy salvation ere I speak. I swear to dedicate my cunning and my strength, my silence and whatever else is mine to thy commands. You think we should devise his death? And execute what is devised, and suddenly we must be brief and bold. And yet most cautious. For the jealous laws would punish us with death and infamy for that which it became themselves to do. Be cautious as you may, but prompt. Orsino, what are the means? I know two dull, fierce outlaws, who think men's spirit as a worm's, and they would trample out, for any slight caprice, the meanest or the noblest life. This mood is marketable here in Rome. They sell what we now want. Tomorrow before dawn, Chen Shi will take us to that lonely rock Petrella in the Apulian Apennines. If he arrive there, he must not arrive. Will it be dark before you reach the tower? The sun will scarce be set. But I remember two miles on this side of the fort. The road crosses a deep ravine. Tis rough and narrow, and winds with short turns down the precipice. And in its depth there is a mighty rock, which has, from unimaginable years, sustained itself with terror and with toil, over a gulf, and with the agony of which it clings, seems slowly coming down, even as a wretched soul, hour after hour, clings to the mass of life. Yet clinging, leans, and leaning makes more dark the dread abyss in which it fears to fall. Beneath this crag, Huge as despair, as if in weariness, the melancholy mountain yawns. Below, you hear, but see not an impetuous torrent raging among the caverns, and a bridge crosses the chasm, and high above there grow, with intersecting trunks from crag to crag, 
cedars, and yews and pines, whose tangled hair is matted in one solid roof of shade by the dark ivy's twine. At noonday here, tis twilight, and at sunset, blackest night. Before you reach that bridge, make some excuse for spurring on your mules, or loitering, until... What sound is that? Hark! No, it cannot be a servant's step. It must be Chen Chi, unexpectedly returned. Make some excuse for being here. Beatrice to Orsino as she goes out. That step we hear approach must never pass the bridge of which we speak. Exeunt Lucretia and Beatrice. What shall I do? Chen Chi must find me here and I must bear the imperious inquisition of his looks as to what brought me hither. Let me mask mine own in some inane and vacant smile. Enter Giacomo in a hurried manner. Ah, oh, have you ventured hither? Know you then that Genshi is from home? I sought him here, and now must wait till he returns. Great God! Weigh you the danger of this rashness? I, does my destroyer know his danger? We are now no more, as once parent and child, but man to man, the oppressor to the oppressed, the slanderer to the slandered, foe to foe. He has cast nature off, which was his shield, and nature casts him off, who is her shame. And I spurn both. Is it a father's throat which I will shake and say, I ask not gold, I ask not happy years, nor memories of tranquil childhood, nor home-sheltered love, though all these thou hast torn from me, and more, but only my fair fame, only one hoard of peace, which I thought hidden from thy hate under the penury heaped on me by thee. Or oh, I will. God can understand and pardon. Why should I speak with man? Be calm, dear friend. Well, I will calmly tell you what he did. This old Francesco Cenci, as you know, borrowed the dowry of my wife from me, and then denied the loan, and left me so in poverty, the which I sought to mend by holding a poor office in the state. It had been promised to me, and already I bought new clothing for my ragged babes, and my wife smiled, my heart knew repose. When Chenji's intercession, as I found, conferred this office on a wretch, whom thus he paid for vilest service. I returned with this ill news, and we sat sad together, solacing our despondency with tears of such affection and unbroken faith as temper life's worst bitterness, when he, as he is wont, came to upbraid and curse, mocking our poverty, and telling us such was God's scourge for disobedient sons, and then, that I might strike him dumb with shame, I spoke of my wife's dowry, but he coined a brief yet specious tale of how I had wasted the sum in secret riot, and he saw my wife was touched, and he went smiling forth, and when I knew the impression he had made, I felt my wife insult with silent scorn my ardent truth and look averse and cold. I went forth too, but soon returned again, yet not so soon but that my wife had taught my children her harsh thoughts, and they all cried, Give us clothes, father, give us better food. What you in one night squander? were enough for months. I looked and saw that home was hell, and to that hell will I return no more until mine enemy has rendered up atonement, or, as he gave life to me, 
I will, reversing nature's law. Trust me, the compensation which thou seekest here will be denied. Then are you not my friend? Did you not hint at the alternative upon the brink of which you see I stand? The other day when we conversed together, my wrongs were then less. The word parricide, although I am resolved, haunts me like fear. It must be fear itself, for the bare word is hollow mockery. Mark how wisest God draws to one point the threads of a just doom, so sanctifying it. What you devise is, as it were, accomplished. Is he dead? His grave is ready. Know that since we met, Chen Shi has done an outrage to his daughter. What outrage? That she speaks not. But you may conceive such half-conjectures as I do from her fixed paleness and the lofty grief of her stern brow bent on the idle air and her severe unmodulated voice drowning both tenderness and dread. And last, from this, that whilst her stepmother and I, bewildered in our horror, talked together with obscure hints, both self-misunderstood and darkly guessing, Stumbling in our talk over the truth, and yet to its revenge, she interrupted us, and with a look which told before she spoke it, he must die. It is enough. My doubts are well appeased. There is a higher reason for the act than mine. There is a holier judge than me, a more unblamed avenger. Beatrice, who in the gentleness of thy sweet youth hast never trodden on a worm or bruised a living flower, but thou hast pitied it with needless tears. Fair sister, thou in whom men wondered how such loveliness and wisdom did not destroy each other, is there made ravage of thee? O oh, heart, I ask no more justification. Shall I wait, Orsino, till he return, and stab him at the door? Not so. Some accident might interpose to rescue him from what is now most sure, and you are unprovided where to fly, how to excuse or to conceal. Nay, listen. All is contrived. Success is so assured that... Enter Beatrice. "'Tis my brother's voice. You know me not. "'My sister, my lost sister.' "'Lost indeed. I see Orsino has talked with you, "'and that you conjecture things too horrible to speak, "'yet far less than the truth. "'Now stay not. He might return. Yet kiss me. "'I shall know that then thou hast consented to his death. "'Farewell, farewell. Let piety to God.' brotherly love, justice and clemency, and all things that make tender, hardest hearts. Make thine hard, brother. Answer not. Farewell. Exeunt severally. Scene 2. A mean apartment in Giacomo's house. Giacomo alone. Tis midnight, and Orsino comes not yet. Thunder and the sound of a storm. What? Can the everlasting elements feel with a worm like man? If so, the shaft of mercy-winged lightning would not fall on stones and trees. My wife and children sleep. They are now living in unmeaning dreams. But I must wake, still doubting if that deed be just, which is most necessary. Oh, thou unreplenished lamp, whose narrow fire is shaken by the wind, and on whose edge devouring darkness hovers, thou small flame, which, as a dying pulse, rises and falls, still flickerest up and down. How very soon did I not feed thee, wouldst thou fail, 
and be as thou hadst never been. So, wastes and sinks, even now, perhaps the life that kindled mine. But that no power can fill with vital oil, that broken lamp of flesh. Ha! Tis the blood which fed these veins that ebbs till all is cold. It is the form that moulded mine that sinks into the white and yellow spasms of death. It is the soul by which mine was arrayed in God's immortal likeness, which now stands naked before heaven's judgment seat. <laughs> One, two, the hours crawl on, and when my hairs are white, my son will then perhaps be waiting thus, tortured between just hate and vain remorse, chiding the tardy messenger of news like those which I expect. I almost wish he be not dead. Although my wrongs are great, yet tis Orsino's step. Enter Orsino. Speak. I am come to say he has escaped. Escaped? And safe within Petrella. He passed by the spot appointed for the deed an hour too soon. Are we the fools of such contingencies? And do we waste in blind misgivings thus the hours when we should act, than wind and thunder, which seemed to howl his knell, is the loud laughter with which heaven mocks our weakness? I henceforth will ne'er repent of aught designed or done, but my repentance. See, the lamp is out. If no remorse is ours, then the dim air has drank this innocent flame. Why should we quail when Chench's life, that light by which ill spirits see the worst deeds they prompt, shall sink for ever? No, I am hardened. Why, what need of this? Who feared the pale intrusion of remorse in a just deed? Although our first plan failed, doubt not but he will soon be laid to rest. But light the lamp, let us not talk in the dark. Giacomo, lighting the lamp. And yet, once quenched, I cannot thus relume my father's life. Do you not think his ghost might plead that argument with God? A once gone, you cannot now recall your sister's peace your own extinguished years of youth and hope, nor your wife's bitter words, nor all the taunts which, from the prosperous, weak misfortune takes, nor your dead mother, nor— Oh, speak no more. I am resolved, although this very hand must quench the life that animated it. There is no need of that. Listen, you know Olympio— the Castellan of Petrola in old Colonna's time, him whom your father degraded from his post, and Marzio, that desperate wretch whom he deprived last year of a reward of blood, well earned and due. I knew Olympio, and they say he hated old Cenci so that in his silent rage his lips grew white only to see him pass. Of Marzio I know nothing. Marzio's hate matches Olympio's. I have sent these men, but in your name, and as at your request, to talk with Beatrice and Lucretia. Only to talk? The moments which even now pass onward to tomorrow's midnight hour may memorize their flight with death. Ere then they must have talked, and may perhaps have done, and made an end. Listen. What sound is that? The house dog moans, and the beams crack, and nothing else. It is my wife complaining in her sleep. I doubt not she is saying bitter things of me, and all my children round her dreaming that I deny them sustenance. 
whilst he who truly took it from them, and who fills their hungry rest with bitterness, now sleeps lapped in bad pleasures, and triumphantly mocks thee in visions of successful hate, too like the truth of day. If e'er he wakes again, I will not trust to hireling hands. Why, that were well. I must be gone. Good night. When next we meet, may all be done. And all forgotten. Oh, that I had never been. Exeunt. Act Four, Scene One. An apartment in the castle of Petrella. Enter Chenchi. She comes not, yet I left her even now, vanquished and faint. She knows the penalty of her delay. Yet what if threats are vain, and I not now within Petrella's moat, or fear I still the eyes and ears of Rome? Might I not drag her by the golden hair, stamp on her, keep her sleepless till her brain be overworn, tame her with chains and famine? Less would suffice. Yet so to leave undone what I most seek? No. "'Tis her stubborn will, which by its own consent "'shall stoop as low as that which drags it down. "'Enter Lucretia. "'Thou loathed wretch, hide thee from my abhorrence. "'Fly, be gone, yet stay. "'Bid Beatrice come hither.' "'O oh, husband, I pray for thine own wretched sake, "'heed what thou dost.' A man who walks like thee through crimes, and through the danger of his crimes, each hour may stumble over a sudden grave. And thou art old, thy hairs are hoary grey. As thou wouldst save thyself from death and hell, pity thy daughter. Give her to some friend in marriage, so that she may tempt thee not to hatred, or worse thoughts, if worse there be. What? Like her sister who has found a home. To mock my hate from with prosperity. Strange ruin shall destroy both her and thee, And all that yet remain. My death may be rapid, Her destiny outspeeds it. Go, bid her come hither, And before my mood be changed, Lest I should drag her by the hair. She sent me to thee, husband. At thy presence she fell, As thou dost know, into a trance. And in that trance she heard a voice which said, Chanchi must die. Let him confess himself. Even now the accusing angel waits to hear if God, to punish his enormous crimes, harden his dying heart. Why, such things are. No doubt divine revealings may be made. Tis plain I have been favored from above. For when I cursed my sons, they died. Aye, so, as to the right or wrong, that's talk. Repentance. Repentance is an easy moment's work, and more depends on God than me. Well, well, I must give up the greater point, which was to poison and corrupt her soul. A pause. Lucretia approaches anxiously, and then shrinks back as he speaks. One, two, I, Rocco, and Cristofano, my curse, strangled, and Giacomo, I think will find life a worse hell than that beyond the grave. Beatrice shall, if there be skill and hate, die in despair, blaspheming. To Bernardo, he is so innocent, I will bequeath the memory of these deeds and make his youth the sepulchre of hope, where evil thoughts shall grow like weeds on a neglected tomb. When all is done, out in the wide campana, I will pile up my silver and my gold, my costly robes, paintings and tapestries, my parchments and all records of my wealth, and make a bonfire in my joy, and leave of my possessions nothing but my name, which shall be an inheritance to strip its wearer bare as infamy. That done, my soul, which is a scourge, 
will I resign into the hands of him who wielded it, be it for its own punishment or theirs. He will not ask it of me till the lash be broken in its last and deepest wound, until its hate be all inflicted. Yet, lest death outspeed my purpose, let me make short work and sure. Going. Lucretia stops him. Oh, stay! It was a feint. She had no vision, and she heard no voice. I said it but to awe thee. That is well. Vile palterer with the sacred truth of God, be thy soul choked with that blaspheming lie. For Beatrice, worse terrors are in store to bend her to my will. Oh, to what will? What cruel sufferings more than she has known canst thou inflict? Andrea, go call my daughter, and if she comes not, tell her that I come. What sufferings? I will drag her, step by step, through infamies unheard of among men. She shall stand shelterless in the broad noon of public scorn. For acts blazoned abroad, one among which shall be. What? Canst thou guess? She shall become. For what she most abhors shall have a fascination to entrap her loathing will. To her own conscious self. All she appears to others, and when dead, as she shall die unshrived and unforgiven, a rebel to her father and her god, her corpse shall be abandoned to the hounds. Her name shall be the terror of the earth. Her spirit shall approach the throne of God, plague spotted with my curses. I will make body and soul a monstrous lump of ruin. Enter Andrea. Lady Beatrice. Speak, pale slave. What said she? My lord, t'was what she looked. She said, Go tell my father that I see the gulf of hell between us two, which he may pass. I will not. Exit Andrea. Go thou quick, Lucretia. Tell her to come. Yet let her understand her coming is consent. And say, moreover, that if she come not, I will curse her. Exit Lucretia. Ha! With what but with a father's curse doth God panic strike, armed victory, and make pale cities in their prosperity. The world's father must grant a parent's prayer against his child. But he who asks even what men call me, will not the deaths of her rebellious brothers awe her before I speak? For I on them did imprecate quick ruin, and it came. Enter Lucretia. Well, what? Speak, wretch. She said, I cannot come. Go tell my father that I see a torrent of his own blood raging between us. Chenchi kneeling. God, hear me. If this most specious mass of flesh, which thou hast made my daughter, this my blood, this particle of my divided being, or rather, this my bane and my disease, whose sight infects and poisons me. This devil which sprung from me as from a hell was meant to aught good use, if her bright loveliness was kindled to illumine this dark world. If nursed by thy selectest dew of love, some virtues blossom in her as should make the peace of life, I pray thee for my sake, as thou the common God and Father art, of her and me and all. Reverse that doom. Earth, in the name of God, let her food be poison, till she be encrusted round with leprous stains. Heaven, rain upon her head the blistering drops of the marima's dew, till she be speckled like a toad. Parch up those love-enkindled lips, 
warp those fine limbs to loathed lameness. All beholding sun, strike in thine envy those life-darting eyes with thine own blinding beams. Peace, peace, for thine own sake, unsay those dreadful words. When high God grants, he punishes such prayers. Chen Chi leaping up and throwing his right hand towards heaven. He does his will, I mine. This in addition, that if she have a child. Horrible thought. That if she ever have a child, and thou, quick nature, I adjure thee by thy God, that thou be fruitful in her, and increase and multiply, fulfilling his command, and my deep imprecation, may it be a hideous likeness of herself, that as from a distorting mirror she may see, her image mixed with what she most abhors, smiling upon her from her nursing breast, and that the child may from its infancy grow day by day more wicked and deformed, turning her mother's love to misery, and that both she and it may live until it shall repay her care and pain with hate, or what may else be more unnatural, so he may hunt her through the clamorous scoffs of the loud world to a dishonored grave. Shall I revoke this curse? Go, bid her come, before my words are chronicled in heaven. Exit Lucretia. I do not feel as if I were a man, but like a fiend appointed to chastise the offenses of some unremembered world. My blood is running up and down my veins. A fearful pleasure makes it prick and tingle. I feel a giddy sickness of strange awe. My heart is beating with an expectation of horrid joy. Enter Lucretia. What? Speak! She bids thee curse, and if thy curses, as they cannot do, could kill her soul, she would not come. Tis well. I can do both. First take what I demand, and then extort concession. To thy chamber. Fly, ere I spurn thee, and beware this night that thou cross not my footsteps. It were safer to come between the tiger and his prey. Exit Lucretia. It must be late. Mine eyes grow weary dim with unaccustomed heaviness of sleep. Conscience, oh, thou most insolent of lies, they say that sleep, that healing dew of heaven, steeps not in balm the foldings of the brain, which thinks thee an impostor. I will go first to belie thee with an hour of rest, which will be deep and calm, I feel. And then, oh, multitudinous hell, the fiends will shake thine arches with the laughter of their joy. There shall be lamentation heard in heaven, as o'er an angel fallen, and upon earth all good shall droop and sicken, and ill things shall, with a spirit of unnatural life, stir and be quickened, even as I am now. Exit Scene 2 Before the Castle of Petrella Enter Beatrice and Lucretia above on the rampart. They come not yet. Tis scarce midnight. How slow behind the course of thought, even sick with speed, lags leaden-footed time. The minutes pass. If he should wake before the deed is done. Oh, mother, he must never wake again. What thou hast said persuades me that our act will but dislodge a spirit of deep hell out of a human form. Tis true. He spoke of death and judgment with strange confidence for one so wicked, as a man believing in God yet recking not of good or ill, and yet to die without confession. Oh, believe that heaven is merciful and just, and will not add our dread necessity to the amount of his offenses. Enter Olympio and Marzio below. See, they come. 
All mortal things must hasten thus to their dark end. Let us go down. Exeunt Lucretia and Beatrice from above. How feel you to this work? As one who thinks a thousand crowns excellent market price for an old murderer's life. Your cheeks are pale. It is the white reflection of your own which you call pale. Is that their natural hue? Or tis my hate and the deferred desire to wreak it which extinguishes their blood? You are inclined then to this business? Ay, if one should bribe me with a thousand crowns to kill a serpent which had stung my child, I could not be more willing. Enter Beatrice and Lucretia below. Noble ladies. Are ye resolved? Is he asleep? Is all quiet? I mixed an opiate with his drink. He sleeps so soundly. That his death will be but as a change of sin-chastising dreams, a dark continuance of the hell within him, which God extinguish. But ye are resolved? You know it is a high and holy deed. We are resolved. As to how this act be warranted, it rests with you. Well, follow. Hush, hark. What noise is that? Ah, someone comes. Ye conscious-stricken cravens, rock to rest your baby hearts. It is the iron gate which ye left open, swinging to the wind, that enters whistling as in scorn. Come, follow, and be your steps like mine, light, quick, and bold. Exeunt Scene 3. An apartment in the castle. Enter Beatrice and Lucretia. They are about it now. Nay, it is done. I have not heard him groan. He will not groan. What sound is that? List, tis the tread of feet about his bed. My God, if he be now a cold, stiff corpse. Oh, fear not what may be done, but what is left undone. The act seals all. Enter Olympio and Marzio. Is it accomplished? Of what? Did you not call? When? Now. I ask if all is over. We dare not kill an old and sleeping man. His thin gray hair, his stern and reverent brow, his veined hands crossed on his heaving breast, and the calm, innocent sleep in which he lay quelled me. Indeed, indeed, I cannot do it. But I was bolder, for I chide Olympio and bade him bear his wrongs to his own grave, and leave me the reward. And now my knife touched the loose, wrinkled throat when the old man stirred in his sleep, and said, God, hear, oh, hear, a father's curse. What art thou, not our father? And then he laughed. I knew it was the ghost of my dead father speaking through his lips, and could not kill him. Miserable slaves! Where, if ye dare not kill a sleeping man, found ye the boldness to return to me with such a deed undone? Base palterers, cowards, and traitors! Why, the very conscience which ye would sell for gold and for revenge is an equivocation! It sleeps over a thousand daily acts disgracing men, and when a deed where mercy insults heaven, why do I talk? Snatching a dagger from one of them and raising it. Hadst thou a tongue to say she murdered her own father, I must do it. But never dream ye shall outlive him long. Stop, for God's sake. I will go back and kill him. Give me the weapon. We must do thy will. Take it. Depart. Return. Exeunt Olympio and Marzio. How pale thou art. We do that which twere a deadly crime to leave undone. Would it were done. Even whilst that doubt is passing through your mind, the world is conscious of a change. 
Darkness and hell have swallowed up the vapor they sent forth to blacken the sweet light of life. My breath comes, methinks, lighter, and the jellied blood runs freely through my veins. Hark! Enter Olympio and Marcio. He is... Dead. We strangled him that there might be no blood, and then we threw his heavy corpse in the garden under the balcony. Twill seem it fell. Beatrice, giving them a bag of coin. Here, take this gold and hasten to your homes. And Marzio, because thou wast only awed by that which made me tremble, wear thou this. Clothes him in a rich mantle. It was the mantle which my grandfather wore in his high prosperity, and men envied his state. So may they envy thine. Thou wert a weapon in the hand of God to a just use. Live long and thrive. And mark, if thou hast crimes, repent. This deed is none. <laughs> Tis the castle horn. My God, it sounds like the last trump. Some tedious guest is coming. The drawbridge is let down. There is a tramp of horses in the court. Fly, hide yourselves. Exeunt Olympio and Marzio. Let us retire to counterfeit deep rest. I scarcely need to counterfeit it now. The spirit which doth reign within these limbs seems strangely undisturbed. I could even sleep fearless and calm. All ill is surely past. Exeunt. Scene 4. Another apartment in the castle. Enter on one side the legate Savella, introduced by a servant, and on the other Lucretia and Bernardo. Lady, my duty to his holiness be my excuse that thus unseasonably I break upon your rest. I must speak with Count Cenci. Doth he sleep? Lucretia, in a hurried and confused manner. I think he sleeps. Yet wake him not, I pray. Spare me a while. He is a wicked and a wrathful man. Should he be roused out of his sleep tonight, which is, I know, a hell of angry dreams, twill not well. Indeed it were not well. Wait till daybreak. Aside. Oh, I am deadly sick. I grieve thus to distress you, but the Count must answer charges of the gravest import, and suddenly such my commission is. Lucretia, with increased agitation. I dare not rouse him. I know none who dare. T'were perilous. You might as safely waken a serpent, or a corpse in which some fiend were laid to sleep. Lady, my moments here are counted. I must rouse him from his sleep, since none else dare. Lucretia, aside. Oh, terror! Oh, despair! To Bernardo. Bernardo, conduct you, the Lord Legate, to your father's chamber. Exeunt Savella and Bernardo. Enter Beatrice. Tis a messenger. Come to arrest the culprit who now stands before the throne of unappealable God. Both heaven and earth, consenting arbiters, acquit our deed. Oh, agony of fear! Would that he yet might live! Even now I heard the legate's followers whisper as they passed. They had a warrant for his instant death. All was prepared by unforbidden means, which we must pay so dearly having done. Even now they search the tower and find the body. Now they suspect the truth. Now they consult, before they come to tax us with the fact. Oh, horrible! Tis all discovered. Mother, what is done wisely is done well. Be bold as thou art just. "'Tis like a truant child to fear that others know what thou hast done, "'even from thine own strong consciousness. "'And thus write on unsteady eyes and altered cheeks all thou wouldst hide. "'Be faithful to thyself, 
and fear no other witness but thy fear. For if, as cannot be, some circumstance should rise in accusation, we can blind suspicion with such cheap astonishment, or overbear it with such guiltless pride, as murderers cannot feign. The deed is done, and what may follow now regards not me. I am as universal as the light, free as the earth's surrounding air, as firm as the world's center. Consequence to me is as the wind which strikes the solid rock, but shakes it not. A cry within and tumult. Murder! 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 Enter Bernardo and Savella. Savella to his followers. Go search the castle round, sound the alarm, look to the gates that none escape. What now? I know not what to say. My father's dead. How? Dead? He only sleeps. You mistake, brother. His sleep is very calm, very like death. Tis wonderful how well a tyrant sleeps. He is not dead. Dead. Murdered. Lucretia with extreme agitation. Oh, no, no. He is not murdered, though he may be dead. I have alone the keys of those apartments. Ha! Huh. Is it so? My lord, I pray excuse us. We will retire. My mother is not well. She seems quite overcome with this strange horror. Exeunt Lucretia and Beatrice. Can you suspect who may have murdered him? I know not what to think. Can you name any who had an interest in his death? Alas, I can name none who had not, and those most who most lament that such a deed is done, my mother, my sister, and myself. Tis strange. There were clear marks of violence. I found the old man's body in the moonlight, hanging beneath the window of his chamber, among the branches of a pine. He could not have fallen there, for all his limbs lay heaped and effortless. "'Tis true there was no blood. "'Favour me, sir. "'It much imports your house that all should be made clear "'to tell the ladies that I request their presence.' "'Exit Bernardo. "'Enter guards, bringing in Marzio. "'We have one. "'My lord, we found this ruffian and another lurking among the rocks.' There is no doubt but that they are the murderers of Count Chenchi. Each had a bag of coin. This fellow wore a gold woven robe, which, shining bright under the dark rocks to the glimmering moon, betrayed them to our notice. The other fell desperately fighting. What does he confess? He keeps firm silence, but these lines found on him may speak. Their language is at least sincere. Reads. To the Lady Beatrice, that the atonement of what my nature sickens to conjecture may soon arrive, I send thee, at thy brother's desire, those who will speak and do more than I dare write. Thy devoted servant, Orsino. Enter Lucretia, Beatrice, and Bernardo. Knowest thou this writing, lady? No. Nor thou? Lucretia, her conduct throughout the scene is marked by extreme agitation. Where was it found? What is it? It should be Orsino's hand. It speaks of that strange horror which never yet found utterance but which made between that hapless child and her dead father a gulf of obscure hatred. Is it so? Is it true, lady, that thy father did such outrages as to awaken in thee unfilial hate? Not hate, t'was more than hate. This is most true. Yet wherefore question me? There is a deed demanding question done. Thou hast a secret which will answer not. What sayest? My lord, your words are bold and rash. 
I do arrest all present in the name of the Pope's holiness. You must to Rome. Oh, not to Rome. Indeed, we are not guilty. Guilty? Who dares talk of guilt? My lord, I am more innocent of parasite than is a child born fatherless. Dear mother, your gentleness and patience are no shield for this keen judging world, this two-edged lie, which seems, but is not. What, will human laws, rather will ye who are their ministers, bar all access to retribution first? And then, when heaven doth interpose to do what ye neglect, arming familiar things to the redress of an unwanted crime, make ye the victims who demanded its culprits. Tis ye are the culprits. That poor wretch who stands so pale and trembling and amazed, if it be true he murdered Chen Chi, was a sword in the right hand of justice God. Wherefore should I have wielded it? Unless the crimes which mortal tongue dare never name, God therefore scruples to avenge. You own that you desired his death? It would have been a crime no less than his, if for one moment that fierce desire had faded in my heart. Tis true, I did believe, and hope, and pray. I, I even knew, for God is wise and just, that some strange sudden death hung over him. Tis true that this did happen, and most true there was no other rest for me on earth, no other hope in heaven. Now what of this? Strange thoughts beget strange deeds, and here of both, I judge thee not. And yet, if you arrest me, you are the judge and executioner of that which is the life of life. The breath of accusation kills an innocent name, and leaves for lame acquittal the poor life which is a mask without it. Tis most false that I am guilty of foul parricide. Although I must rejoice, for justice cause, that other hands have sent my father's soul to ask the mercy he denied to me. Now leave us free. Stay not a noble house with vague surmises of rejected crime. Add to our sufferings and your own neglect no heavier sum. Let them have been enough. Leave us the wreck we have. I dare not, lady. I pray that you prepare yourselves for Rome. There the Pope's further pleasure will be known. Oh, not to Rome! Oh, take us not to Rome! Why not to Rome, dear mother? There, as here, our innocence is as an armed heel to trample accusation. God is there, as here, and with his shadow ever close the innocent, the injured and the weak, as such are we. Cheer up, dear lady, lean on me, collect your wandering thoughts. My lord, as soon as you have taken some refreshment and had all examinations made upon the spot, as may be necessary to the full understanding of this matter, we shall be ready. Mother, will you come? <laughs> they will bind us to the wreck and wrest self-accusation from our agony. Will Giacomo be there, Orsino, Marzio, all present, all confronted, all demanding each from the other's countenance the thing which is in every heart? Oh, misery! She faints and is borne out. She faints? An ill appearance, this. My lord, she knows not yet the uses of the world. She fears that power is as a beast which grasps and loosens not, a snake whose look transmutes all things to guilt, which is its nutriment. She cannot know how well the supine slaves of blind authority read the truth of things when written on a brow of guilelessness. She sees not yet triumphant innocence, stand at the judgment seat of mortal man, a judge and an accuser of the wrong which drags it there. Prepare yourself, my lord. Our suite will join yours in the court below. Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 1. An apartment in Orsino's palace. Enter Orsino and Giacomo. To evil deeds thus quickly come to end? 
Oh, that the vain remorse which must chastise crimes done had but as loud a voice to warn as its keen sting is mortal to avenge. Oh, that the hour when present had cast off the mantle of its mystery and shown the ghastly form with which it now returns when its scared game is roused, cheering the hounds of conscience to their prey. Alas, alas, it was a wicked thought, a piteous deed, to kill an old and hoary-headed father. It has turned out unluckily, in truth. To violate the sacred doors of sleep, to cheat kind nature of the placid death which she prepares for over-wearied age, to drag from heaven an unrepentant soul which might have quenched in reconciling prayers a life of burning crimes. You cannot say I urged you to the deed. Oh, had I never found in thy smooth and ready countenance the mirror of my darkest thoughts, hadst thou never with hints and questions made me look upon the monster of my thought until it grew familiar to desire? Tis thus men cast the blame of their unprosperous acts upon the abettors of their own resolve, or anything but their weak, guilty selves. And yet, confess the truth, it is the peril in which you stand that gives you this pale sickness of penitence. Confess, tis fear disguised from its own shame that takes the mantle now of thin remorse. What if we yet were safe? How can that be? Already Beatrice, Lucretia, and the murderer are in prison. I doubt not officers are, whilst we speak, sent to arrest us. I have all prepared for instant flight. We can escape even now, so we take fleet occasion by the hair. Rather expire in tortures as I may, what will you cast by self-accusing flight, assured conviction upon Beatrice? She, who alone in this unnatural work, stands like God's angel ministered upon by fiends, avenging such a nameless wrong as turns black parricide to piety, whilst we for basest ends. I fear, Orsino, while I consider all your words and looks, Comparing them with your proposal now, that you must be a villain. For what end could you engage in such a perilous crime, training me on with hints and signs and smiles, even to this gulf? Thou art no liar? No, thou art a lie, traitor and murderer, coward and slave. But, no, defend thyself. Drawing let the sword speak what the indignant tongue disdains to brand thee with. Put up your weapon. Is it the desperation of your fear that makes you thus rash and sudden with a friend, now ruined for your sake? If honest anger have moved you, know that what I just proposed was but to try you. As for me, I think... Thankless affection led me to this point, from which, if my firm temper could repent, I cannot now recede. Even whilst we speak, the ministers of justice wait below. They grant me these brief moments. Now, if you have any word of melancholy comfort to speak to your pale wife, twere best to pass out at the postern, and avoid them so. Oh, generous friend! How canst thou pardon me? Would that my life could purchase thine. That wish now comes a day too late. Haste, fare thee well. Hearest thou not steps along the corridor? Exit Giacomo. I'm sorry for it, but the guards are waiting at his own gate, and such was my contrivance that I might rid me both of him and them. I thought to act a solemn comedy upon the painted scene of this new world, 
and to attain my own peculiar ends by some such plot of mingled good and ill as others weave. But there arose a power which grasped and snapped the threads of my device and turned it into a net of ruin. Ah! A shout is heard. Is that my name I hear proclaimed abroad? But I will pass, wrapped in a vile disguise, rags on my back, and a false innocence upon my face, through the misdeeming crowd which judges by what it seems. Tis easy, then, for a new name, and for a country new, and a new life fashioned on old desires, to change the honors of abandoned Rome. And these must be the masks of that within, which must remain unaltered. Oh, I fear that what is past will never let me rest. Why, when none else is conscious but myself of my misdeeds, should my own heart's contempt trouble me? Have I not the power to fly my own reproaches? Shall I be the slave of, what, a word, which those of this false world employ against each other, not themselves, as men wear daggers not for self-offense? But if I am mistaken, where shall I find the disguise to hide me from myself, as I now skulk from every other eye? Exit Scene 2 A Hall of Justice Camillo, Judges, etc. are discovered seated. Marzio is led in. Accused, do you persist in your denial? I ask you, are you innocent or guilty? I demand, who are the participators in your offence? Speak truth and the whole truth. My God, I did not kill him. I know nothing. Olympial sold the robe to me from which you would infer my guilt. Away with him! Dare you, with lips yet white from the rag's kiss, speak false? Is it so soft to question her that you would bend the lover's talk with it till it wind up your life and soul? Away! Spare me! Oh, spare! I will confess! Then speak! I strangled him in his sleep! Who urged you to it? His own son, Giacomo, and the young prelate, Orsinio, sent me to Pratella. There the ladies Beatrice and Lucretia tempted me with a thousand crowns, and I and my companion forthwith murdered him. Now let me die. This sounds as bad as truth. God's there. Lead for the prisoners. Enter Lucretia, Beatrice, and Giacomo, guarded. Look upon this man. When did you see him last? We never saw him. You know me too well, Lady Beatrice. I know thee. How? Where? When? You know twas I whom you did urge with menaces and bribes to kill your father. When the thing was done, you clothed me in a robe of woven gold and bade me thrive. How I have thriven, you see. You, my lord Giacomo, Lady Lucretia, you know that what I speak is true. Beatrice advances towards him. He covers his face and shrinks back. Oh, Dart, the terrible resentment of those eyes on the dead earth. Turn them away from me. They wound. Twas torture forced the truth. My lords, having said this, let me be led to death. Poor wretch, I pity thee. Yet stay a while. Guards, lead him not away. Cardinal Camillo, you have a good repute for gentleness and wisdom. Can it be that you sit here to countenance a wicked farce like this, when some obscure and trembling slave is dragged from sufferings which might shake the sternest heart, and bade to answer, not as he believes, but those who may suspect or do desire, whose questions then suggest their own reply. And in that peril of such hideous torments, as merciful God spares even the damned, speak now the thing you surely know, which is that you, 
If your fine frame were stretched upon that wheel, and you were told, Confess that you did poison your little nephew, that fair blue-eyed child who was the lodestar of your life. And though all see, since his most swift and piteous death, that day and night, and heaven and earth, and time, and all the things hoped for or done therein, are changed to you through your exceeding grief, yet you would say, I confess anything, and beg from your tormentors, like that slave, the refuge of dishonorable death. I pray thee, Cardinal, that thou assert my innocence. Camillo, much moved. What shall we think, my lords? Shame on these tears. I thought my heart was frozen, which is their fountain. I would pledge my soul that she is guiltless. Yet she must be tortured. I would as soon have tortured mine own nephew. If he now lived, he would be just her age. His hair, too, was her colour, and his eyes, like hers in shape, but blue and not so deep, as that most perfect image of God's love that ever came sorrowing upon the earth. She is as pure as speechless infancy. Well, be her purity on your head, my lord, if you forbid the wreck. His holiness enjoined us to pursue this monstrous crime by the severest forms of law, nay, even to stretch a point against the criminals. The prisoners stand accused of parricide upon such evidence as justifies torture. What evidence? This man's? Even so. Beatrice, to Marzio. Come near. And who art thou thus chosen forth? out of the multitude of living men to kill the innocent. I am Marzio, thy father's vassal. Fix thine eyes on mine. Answer to what I ask. Turning to the judges. I prithee, mark his countenance, unlike bold calumny, which sometimes dares not speak the thing it looks. He dares not look the thing he speaks, but bends his gaze on the blind earth. To Marzio. What? Wilt thou say that I did murder my own father? Oh, spare me. My brain swims round. I cannot speak. It was that horrid torture forced the truth. Take me away. Oh, let her not look on me. I am a guilty, miserable wretch. I have said all I know. Now let me die. My lords, if by my nature I had been so stern as to have planned the crime alleged, which your suspicions dictate to this slave and the rack makes him utter, do you think I should have left this two-edged instrument of my misdeed? This man, this bloody knife with my own name engraven on the heft, lying unsheathed amid a world of foes for my own death, that with such horrible need for deepest silence I should have neglected so trivial a precaution as the making his tomb the keeper of a secret written on a thief's memory. What is his poor life? What are a thousand lives? A parasite had trampled them like dust. And see, he lives. Turning to Marzio. And thou. Oh, spare me. Speak to me no more. That stern yet piteous look those solemn tones wound worse than torture. To the judges. I have told it all. For pity's sake, lead me away to death. Guards, lead him nearer the Lady Beatrice. He shrinks from her regard like autumn's leaf from the keen breath of the serenest north. O oh, thou who tremblest on the giddy verge of life and death, pause ere thou answerest me. So mayest thou answer God with less dismay. What evil have we done thee? I, alas, have lived but on this earth a few sad years. And so my lot was ordered, 
that a father first turned the moments of awakening life to drops, each poisoning youth's sweet hope, and then stabbed with one blow my everlasting soul. And my untainted fame, and even that peace which sleeps within the core of the heart's heart, but the wound was not mortal. So my hate became the only worship I could lift to our great father, who in pity and love armed thee, as thou dost say, to cut him off, and thus his wrong becomes my accusation. And art thou the accuser? If thou hopest mercy in heaven, show justice upon earth. Worse than a bloody hand is a hard heart. If thou hast done murders, made thy life's path over the trampled laws of God and man, rush not before thy judge and say, My Maker, I have done this and more. For there was one who was most pure and innocent on earth, and because she endured what never any guilty or innocent endured before, because her wrongs could not be told, not thought, because thy hand at length did rescue her. I wish my words killed her and all her kin. Think, I adjure you, what it is to slay the reverence living in the minds of men towards our ancient house and stainless fame. Think what it is to strangle infant pity, cradled in the belief of guileless looks, till it become a crime to suffer. Think what tis to blot with infamy and blood all that which shows like innocence, and is. Hear me, great God, I swear most innocent, so that the world lose all discrimination between the sly, fierce, wild regard of guilt and that which now compels thee to reply to what I ask, am I or am I not a parasite? Thou art not. What is this? I here declare those whom I did accuse are innocent. Tis I alone am guilty. Drag him away to torments. Let them be subtle and long drawn out to tear the faults of the heart's inmost cell and bind him not till he confess. Torture me as ye will. A keener pain has wrung a higher truth from my last breath. She is most innocent. Bloodhounds, not men, glut yourselves well with me. I will not give you that fine piece of nature to rend and ruin. Exit Marzio, guarded. What say ye now, my lords? Let torture strain the truth, till it be as white as snow try sifted by the frozen wind. Yet stained with blood. Judge to Beatrice. Know you this paper, lady? Entrap me not with questions. Who stands here as my accuser? Ha! Wilt thou be he who art my judge? Accuser, witness, judge, what, all in one? Here is Orsino's name. Where is Orsino? Let his eye meet mine. What means this scrawl? Alas, ye know not what, and therefore on the chance that it may be some evil, will ye kill us. Enter an officer. Marcio's dead. What did he say? Nothing. As soon as we had bound him on the wheel, he smiled on us, as one who baffles a deep adversary, and, holding his breath, died. There remains nothing but to apply the question to those prisoners who yet remain stubborn. I overrule further proceedings, and in the behalf of these most innocent and noble persons will use my interest with the Holy Father. Let the Pope's pleasure then be done. Meanwhile, conduct these culprits each to separate souls and be the engines ready. For this night, if the Pope's resolution be as grave, pious, and just as once I'll wring the truth out of those nerves and sinews, groan by groan. Exeunt Scene 3 The Cell of a Prison Beatrice is discovered asleep on a couch. Enter Bernardo. 
How gently slumber rests upon her face, like the last thoughts of some day sweetly spent, closing in night and dreams and so prolonged. After such torments as she bore last night, how light and soft her breathing comes. Ay, me, methinks that I shall never sleep again. But I must shake the heavenly dew of rest from this sweet folded flower thus. Wake, awake. What, sister, canst thou sleep? Beatrice awaking. I was just dreaming that we were all in paradise. Thou knowest this cell seems like a kind of paradise after our father's presence. Dear, dear sister, would that thy dream were not a dream. Oh, God, how shall I tell? What wouldst thou tell, sweet brother? Look not so calm and happy, or even whilst I stand considering what I have to say. My heart will break. Now see, thou makest me weep. How very friendless thou wouldst be, dear child, if I were dead. Say what thou hast to say. They have confessed. They could endure no more the tortures. Ha! Huh, what was there to confess? They must have told some weak and wicked lie to flatter their tormentors. Have they said that they were guilty? Oh, white innocence, that thou shouldst wear the mask of guilt to hide thine awful and serenest countenance from those who know thee not. Enter judge with Lucretia and Giacomo guarded. Ignoble hearts, for some brief spasm of pain, which are at least as mortal as the limbs through which they pass, are centuries of high splendor laid in dust. And that eternal honor which should live sunlike above the reek of mortal fame, changed to a mockery and a byword. What, will you give up these bodies to be dragged at horses' heels, so that our hair shall sweep the footsteps of the vain and senseless crowd, who that they make our calamity? Their worship and their spectacle will leave the churches and the theaters as void as their own hearts. Shall the light multitude fling, at their choice, curses or faded pity, sad funeral flowers to deck a living corpse upon us as we pass to pass away? And leave, what memory of our having been? Infamy, blood, terror, despair. O oh, thou, who wert a mother to the parentless, kill not thy child. Let not her wrongs kill thee. Brother, lie down with me upon the rack, and let us each be silent as a corpse. It will soon be as soft as any grave. Tis but the falsehood it can wring from fear makes the rack cruel. They will tear the truth even from thee at last. Those cruel pains, for pity's sake, say thou art guilty now. Oh, speak the truth. Let us all quickly die. And after death, God is our judge, not they. He will have mercy on us. If indeed it can be true, say so, dear sister mine. And then the Pope will surely pardon you, and all will be well. Confess, or I will warp your limbs with such keen tortures. Tortures? Turn the rack henceforth into a spinning wheel. Torture your dog, that he may tell when last he lapped the blood his master shed. Not me. My pangs are of the mind, and of the heart, and of the soul. I, of the inmost soul, which weeps within tears as of burning gall, to see, in this ill world, where none are true, my kindred false to their deserted selves. And with concerning all the wretched life which I have lived, and its now wretched end, and the small justice shown by heaven and earth to me or mine, and what a tyrant thou art, and what slaves these, and what a world we make, the oppressor and the oppressed, such pangs compel my answer. What is it thou wouldst with me? Art thou not guilty of thy father's debts? Or wilt thy rather tax, high judging God, that he permitted such an act as that which I have suffered, and which he beheld, made it unutterable, 
and took from it all refuge, all revenge, all consequence, but that which thou hast called my father's death, which is or is not what men call a crime, which either I have done or have not done, say what ye will, I shall deny no more. If ye desire it thus, thus let it be, and so an end of all. Now do your will, no other pain shall force another word. She is convicted but has not confessed, beat enough, until their final sentence that none have conversed with them. You, young lord, linger not here. Oh, tear him not away. Gods, do your duty. Bernardo, embracing Beatrice. Oh, would you divide body from soul? That is the Edmund's business. Exeunt all but Lucretia, Beatrice, and Giacomo. Have I confessed? Is it all over now? No hope, no refuge. Oh, weak, wicked tongue which hast destroyed me, would that thou hadst been cut out and thrown to dogs first, to have killed my father first and then betrayed my sister, I, thee, the one thing innocent and pure in this black, guilty world to that which I so well deserve. My wife, my little ones, destitute, helpless, and I, Father, God, canst thou forgive even the unforgiving when their full hearts break thus, thus? Covers his face and weeps. O oh, my child, to what a dreadful end are we all come? Why did I yield? Why did I not sustain those torments? Oh, that I were all dissolved into these fast and unavailing tears, which flow and feel not. What t'was weak to do, tis weaker to lament, once being done. Take cheer, the God who knew my wrong, and made our speedy act the angel of his wrath, seems, and but seems, to have abandoned us. Let us not think that we shall die for this. Brother, sit near me. Give me your firm hand. You had a manly heart. Bear up, bear up. Oh, dearest lady, put your gentle head upon my lap and try to sleep a while. Your eyes look pale, hollow, and overworn with heaviness of watching and slow grief. Come, I will sing you some low, sleepy tune, not cheerful, nor yet sad. Some dull old thing, some outworn and unused monotony, such as our country gossips sing and spin, till they almost forget they live. Lie down, so that will do. Have I forgot the words? Faith, they are sadder than I thought they were. False friend, wilt thou smile or weep when my life is laid asleep? Little cares for a smile or a tear, the clay-cold corpse upon the bier. Farewell, hi-ho, what is this whisper's low? There is a snake in thy smile, my dear, and bitter poison within thy tear. Sweet sleep were death like to thee, or if thou couldst mortal be. I would close these eyes of pain, when to wake never again. Oh, world, farewell. Listen to the passing bell. It says thou and I must part with a light 
and a heavy heart. The scene closes. Scene 4. A hall of the prison. Enter Camillo and Bernardo. The Pope is stern, not to be moved or bent. He looked as calm and keen as is the engine which tortures and which kills exempt itself from all that it inflicts. A marble form, a right, a law, a custom, not a man. He frowned as if the frown had been the trick of his machinery, on the advocates presenting the defences which he tore and threw behind, muttering with hoarse, harsh voice, Which among ye defended their old father, killed in his sleep? Then to another, Thou dost this in virtue of thy place, tis well. He turned to me then, looking deprecation, and said these three words coldly, They must die. And yet you left him not. I urged him still, pleading, as I could guess, the devilish wrong which prompted your unnatural parent's death. And he replied, Paolo Santa Croce murdered his mother yester evening, and he is fled. Parricide grows rife that soon, for some just cause, no doubt, the young will strangle us all, dozing in our chairs. Authority and power and hoary hair are grown crime's capital. You are my nephew. You come to ask their pardon. Stay a moment. Here is their sentence. Never see me more till, to the letter, it be all fulfilled. Oh, God, not so. I did believe indeed that all you said was but sad preparation for happy news. Oh, there are words and looks to bend the sternest purpose. Once I knew them, now I forget them at my dearest need. What think you if I seek him out and bathe his feet and robe with hot and bitter tears, importune him with my prayers, vexing his brain with my perpetual cries, until in rage he, he strike me with his pastoral cross and trample across my prostrate head, so that my blood may stain the senseless dust on which he treads, and remorse awaken mercy? I will do it. Oh, wait till I return. Rushes out. Alas, poor boy. A wreck devoted seaman thus might pray to the deaf sea. Enter Lucretia, Beatrice, and Giacomo guarded. I hardly dare to fear that thou bringest other news than a just pardon. May God in heaven be less inexorable to the Pope's prayers than he has been to mine. Here is the sentence and the warrant. Beatrice, wildly. Oh, my God! Can it be possible I have to die so suddenly? So young to go under the obscure, cold, rotting, wormy ground. To be nailed down into a narrow place to see no more sweet sunshine, hear no more blithe voice of living thing, muse not again upon familiar thoughts, sad, yet thus lost. How fearful to be nothing, or to be... What? Oh, where am I? Let me not go mad. Sweet heaven, forgive weak thoughts. If there should be no God, no heaven, no earth in the void world, the wide, gray, lampless, deep, unpeopled world. If all things then should be, my father's spirit, his eye, his voice, his touch surrounding me, the atmosphere and breath of my dead life. If sometimes, as a shape more like himself, even the form which tortured me on earth, masked in gray hairs and wrinkles, 
he should come and wind me in his hellish arms and fix his eyes on mine and drag me down, down, down. For was he not alone omnipotent on earth and ever present? Even though dead, does not his spirit live in all that breathe and work for me and mine still the same ruin, scorn, pain, despair? Who ever yet returned to teach the laws of death's untrodden realm? Unjust, perhaps, as those which drive us now. Oh, whither, whither? Trust in God's sweet love, the tender promises of Christ. Ere night, think we shall be in paradise. Tis past. Whatever comes, my heart shall sink no more. And yet... I know not why your words strike chill. How tedious, false, and cold seems all things. I have met with much injustice in this world. No difference has been made by God or man, or any power molding my wretched lot, twixt good or evil as regarded me. I am cut off from the only world I know, from light and life and love in youth's sweet prime. You do well telling me to trust in God. I hope I do trust in Him. In whom else can any trust? And yet, my heart is cold. During the latter speeches, Giacomo has retired conversing with Camillo, who now goes out. Giacomo advances. Know you not, mother, sister, know you not? Bernardo, even now, is gone to implore the Pope to grant our pardon. Child, perhaps it will be granted. We may all then live to make these woes a tale for distant years. Oh, what a thought! It gushes to my heart like the warm blood. Yet both will soon be cold. Oh, trample out that thought. Worse than despair, worse than the bitterness of death, is hope. It is the only ill which can find place upon the giddy, sharp and narrow hour tottering beneath us. Plead with the swift frost that it should spare the eldest flower of spring. Plead with the awakening earthquake, o'er whose couch even now a city stands, strong, fair, and free. Now stench and blackness yawn like death. Oh, plead with famine, or wind-walking pestilence. Blind lightning, or the deaf sea, not with man. Cruel, cold, formal man, righteous in words, in deeds, a cane. No, mother, we must die. Since such is the reward of innocent lives, such the alleviation of worst wrongs. And whilst our murderers live, and hard, cold men, smiling and slow, walk through a world of tears, to death as to life's sleep, toward just the grave where some strange joy for us. Come, obscure death, and wind me in thine all-embracing arms. Like a fond mother, hide me in thy bosom, and rock me to the sleep from which none wake. Live ye who live, subject to one another, as we were once, who now... Bernardo rushes in. Oh, horrible! The tears, the looks that hopes poured forth in prayer, even till the heart is vacant and despairs, should all be in vain. The ministers of death are waiting round the doors. I thought I saw blood on the face of one. What if it were fancy? Soon the heart's blood of all I love on earth will sprinkle him, and he will wipe it off as it were only rain. Oh, life, a world... Cover me, let me be no more. To see that perfect mirror of pure innocence wherein I gazed and grew happy and good, shivered to dust. To see thee, Beatrice, who made all lovely thou didst look upon, thee, light of life, dead, dark. While I say, sister, to hear I have no sister, and thou, mother, whose love was as a bond to all our loves, dead, the sweet bond broken. Enter Camillo and guards. 
They come. Let me kiss those warm lips before their crimson leaves are blighted, white, cold. Say farewell before death chokes that gentle voice. Oh, let me hear you speak. Farewell, my tender brother. Think of our sad fate with gentleness, as now, and let mild pitying thoughts lighten for thee thy sorrow's load. Err not in harsh despair, but tears and patience. One more thing, my child. For thine own sake, be constant to the love thou bearest us, and to the faith that I, though wrapped in a strange cloud of crime and shame, lived ever holy and unstained. And though ill tongues shall wound me, and our common name be as a mark stamped on thine innocent brow for men to point at as they pass, do thou forbear, and never think a thought unkind of those who perhaps love thee in their graves. So mayest thou die as I do, fear and pain being subdued. Farewell, farewell, farewell. I cannot say farewell. <laughs> oh, Lady Beatrice. Give yourself no unnecessary pain, my dear Lord Cardinal. Here, mother, tie my girdle for me, and bind up this hair in a simple knot. Ay, that does well. And yours, I see, is coming down. How often have we done this for one another? Now we shall not do it any more. My lord, we are quite ready. Well, tis very well. End of The Chenchi by Percy Bysshe Shelley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.